Uh, the next speaker I'd like to invite is Ibnu. And are you walking away or walking here? Thank you for the clicker. <laughs> I've got the clicker. Awesome. So uh, I met uh, Ibnu uh, some years back when I did a carpentry course at Bottle Tree Park. If you've been there, um, it's this little kampong. So he's doing future me in a different way, which is going back to the past and then trying to hold on to our roots, but then, you know, feet in the past, but kind of head in the future. So I think that's a really interesting approach. You can send your kids there so that they can get their hands dirty and then figure out what it was like to do a lot of the things that we used to do when we were living in the kampongs. So I'm going to hand this over to Ibnu. Oh, thank you so much, Kelvin. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. And what I learned about the definition of leave, right? Today's about future of leave is to be alive. So I would like to invite everyone to stand up. Right? Stand up. Yeah, stand up. Okay, awesome. I can stretch, you know, turn left, turn, left, turn right. But I would like you to point your right finger upwards. So we have only one earth, right? We only have one earth. I mean, some people are saying that we are going to build another earth, but that's another issue for another day. Uh, and for us to preserve this earth, this earth, we need to give. So with your left palm, put forward. Yes, very good, very good. And the next thing is, I would, like to put your, I would like you to put your right finger into the left palm of the person beside you. Yes, very good. Yep, that's right. Yes, yes, very good. So we are all connected. Very good. So at the count of three, right, I would like you to grab your friend's finger at the same time try to save your own. Okay, so at the count of three, one, two, three. Ah, who managed to catch? Who managed to catch? Okay, let's try the other side, right? A bit, uh, so try the other, the other way. Right, so now left finger. Point, yes, very good. Okay, the count of three, one, two, four. Ah, eh? nah, okay. Again, again. One, three. Awesome. Okay, let's give each other a round of applause. Okay, so we've gone through the first definition of what live means, right? To be alive. And like what Kelvin pointed out, uh, a lot of what I do in, uh, in Bottle Tree Park at the organization where I serve at now at Grown Up Initiative. It's a lot about living. Uh, living can be, in a lot of ways, very difficult, right? You can talk about life in terms of against death, right? Uh, the idea that, you know, if you are living, you are a part of nature, you are a part of, of something bigger than you. That's one definition of living, to have a soul and you're breathing every day. The second, about, the second definition or the second uh, meaning of what I, I got to understand about living is that of trying to put a certain set of values, a certain set of philosophy that you feel very strongly about or you believe strongly about and put it into practice. And this is usually the hardest, right? And, and, and when, when Kelvin uh, the, and, and the other, others uh, shared, with, or, uh, shared with me about, you know, you know, can you share something about how can we transition Singapore from a garden city to an edible city and the first thing that came to my mind was, why do we want to do that? Right? Why do we want to grow our own food? Uh, is it enough for us as a society, as a nation, to simply just grow food? Right? Uh, and, and the more I start to, to, to do a bit of farming and get to understand what it means to live in, a, in, in Singapore and to work at the Kampong campus, which is a smart village, some people call it a smart village uh, here in Singapore, it made me realize that there is something even deeper than simply growing food. Uh, you learn uh, to take care of things. Uh, I remembered uh, when I was very, very young, uh, when I was in primary four, I was in the gardening club. Uh, so I was, uh, you know, so there will be like a few of us, right, six, seven students, and we take turns to water the plant. Uh, this was in uh, primary school. And there was one day when I forgot to water the plant. So the routine goes, if whoever forgets to water the plant, our teacher would actually call that student to the front of the class. And you know, back in those days, teachers were very strict. Uh, she would actually scold you. Right? She would scold us. Right? Uh, and what happened this time around was, she called my name, you know, come forward. Uh, I know that you forget to, to water the plants uh, during recess time but I would like you to go back to your seat. And then she started to tell a story. Uh, she shared a story about something called Soylent Green. You know, like some of you might have heard about Soylent. How many of you have heard about Soylent? 
Uh, how, may, how many of you have tasted Soylent? <laughs> no, okay. So Soylent Green is a movie set in 2022, right? So it's in the future, right? So we have around six more years to that future. Uh, it's a dystopian future. It's a future where people, or, or rather on Earth, we no longer have any plants. We don't have any more animals. I remember sharing this story with a group of primary school students, and their first reaction was like, hey, then how to eat? Right? Like, and, and, and it's like, what's, so what would be your breakfast? What would be your lunch? What would be your dinner? Uh, and essentially what happened in that movie, uh, it's a dystopian future, and before someone ends, about to end his or her life uh, through aging, they will be sent to a particular room. And in that room, you would see what Earth used to be full of life. Animals, clean rivers, butterflies, uh, elephants, giraffe, and then they will mysteriously disappear into another room, right? And what happens in this room, no one knows, no one on earth knows until someone secretly enters that room. And he discovered that what happened after that was that that is the food manufacturing plant to create Soylent, and Soylent becomes our food, right? So we become a cannibalistic kind of a society, a civilization. And after the incident, uh, my interest in environmentalism became stronger. Even though we are primary school students, our teacher just shared this story. Uh, and he shared with us that, you know, even that simple watering of a plant, it reflects that you care for something else. Uh, the empathy that you have for the plant, such that maybe someday when you grow up, when you become a leader or an educator, you want to take care of something, you know, take care of your home, uh, take care of someone uh, under you, your subordinates, take care of your children. And it's very interesting uh, that, uh, that life alone is a uh, very miraculous thing. Uh. But I will not say so much about this. I would like to show the first video to share about my second definition of live. I am home. I give you comfort. I shelter your family. See me for who I am. Home sweet home. I am your refuge. I am the floor that supports you. The foundation that keeps you steady. The walls that give you shelter. The roof that protects you. I am your home. If you don't take care of me, I cannot take care of you. Yeah, very powerful video. Every time I watch that video, my hair was ten. Right, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a reminder to all of us that uh, we need nature, uh, not really the other way around. So a bit about myself, I am a, trained as an engineer and scientist, uh, yet I love a lot of things beyond that. Uh, this is a picture of me prototyping, having fun at the village uh, where I currently serve. Uh, this is actually just a simple prototype that we made. You know, we see a lot of people after drinking water bottles, they throw away, they discard, so a group of us collect those water bottles and you create like a floating kind of a farm. Lah, right? and, and this is something that I kind of realize as we move forward uh, in the 21st century, disasters are not going to get any easier. Uh, it's actually going to be the reverse. You get to see more floods, you get to see more destruction, earthquakes, and I was thinking, hey, maybe someday right, people can actually build floating farms. Right? So when there's a flood, there's still food. There's a possibility of food. So food has always been uh, 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 the, the, one of the fundamentals of civilization. And I think someone shared earlier that the attitude that Singapore had back in the early days towards water uh, was that of security. Why not food? Right? So I, I, I studied in NUS, but I was also very lucky to be uh, at Silicon Valley. Uh, but that was also the time when I started to understand a bit better about home. 
so th this was my initial inspiration, right? When I was very young, I loved Power Rangers, I loved Captain Planet. Uh, and later on, this further inspired me to, you know, start to take a journey through uh, my own life to understand a bit about the environment. I love cartoons, I love movies, and this is none other than Wally, right? Wally, yep. Wally uh, is an epitome to, uh, to, uh, that I feel that, you know, that this is about how can we take care of the environment. I mean, it's set in this scenario that a robot has to take care of our environment. Uh, what if we ourselves, humans, take responsibility and take ownership of that home uh, called Earth? This is a Soylent Green story which uh, I shared uh, earlier. And this is actually a movie. I mean, I wish maybe 2022, maybe they might come out with a movie, lah, right? They make a remix of the movie. Uh, and then, uh, but something which I start to really, really, really feel about the importance of taking care of nature, uh, and not only just about food, about being edible, but also about how can, we, how can we make Singapore into a city in a forest, like a tropical rainforest that you know, we can also absorb a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, and a lot of pollutants. For example, this was, 2000, uh, this was 1997 haze. I'm asthmatic, right? There was one time when I was in a music class, right, playing the recorder, fee, 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 and then, right, I collapsed. And my teacher was very afraid. Uh, and she essentially, we, were, we, were not, we don't, know what, don't know what to do, right? But after that, this incident made me feel that, you know what, we need to take care of our air. Uh, and if we look deeper, uh, what we consume, has an impact with what happens in Indonesia. Uh, for example, in the food that we eat, some of them has certain kind of oil, uh, which comes from certain kind of palm, uh, and usually the palms are the ones that get deforested. So, I, so when I was young, I liked to do a bit of gardening. I like to look at birds and nature. And this is something which, when I was 15 years old, I start to play around and tinker around with things. Uh, and this was one of the Experiments. I mean, I wasn't the best in class, uh, but my physics teacher pulled me out and started to work on lasers, and we invented something, and we contributed to the, to the literature, scientific literature. And this is something which I start to learn that no matter how small each of us are over here, no matter how young or how new we are to a certain things, if we want to contribute to that larger picture, uh, please do so. Be crazy and just do it. I love, so I did about desalination. I love the arts. Later on, I started to work in vertical gardens and solar panels. Uh, and I was, a very I was very techy. Uh, I felt back then that technology was the way to go uh, for us to transit Singapore from a garden city to a, an edible city to a city in a garden. Uh, how do we power our irrigation pumps, for example? How do we maintain vertical gardens? And, and for those who grow vertical gardens, it's not very, very easy. Invented some rainwater collection system. Uh, but this is where I really discovered the meaning of home, right? Like when I was in Silicon Valley, I started to work in a family uh, in Zong, but I also enjoyed walking around nature over there. Uh, for those who have been to California, there are a lot of farms, right? Napa Valley, people actually, uh, you know, like they harvest uh, a lot of honey from the bees, for example. But one thing which I really love whenever I wake up and I open up the window, right? I wake up, open up a balcony, I would see redwoods and and, and mountains in front of, the, it's like a beautiful view. That's me uh, jumping, uh, that's on top of the mountain. But I wish that, you know, Singapore could go beyond like our current garden city to an edible city, but also to a forest city. Uh, and I wish there'll be more forest that we preserve and the more forest that we come. The first, the first, uh, my first realization about the link between food and environmentalism was when I watched this movie randomly, right? So there was one time during when I was, in, I was still working, interning in HDB, they have this kind of stuff movie, right? Movie sessions. So I just like sneak into one of the, the movie sessions and I watched Shark Water. And this movie made me think a bit harder about shark's fins. Uh, and after that movie, I felt, oh my goodness, if every fin is one shark, then how many sharks are, we, are it's in the ocean not living uh, properly? And beyond this, after, you get, after getting inspired by this, I decided to also do my own research on food. So I went to Medan. Uh, this was post-tsunami. Someone told me, you know, instead of like working at a government or MNC, why not you just do some field work, understand a bit about food in, in, in Indonesia? And I started to interview some of the fishermen. 
and I asked them, do you know about climate change? And fishermen say, what, what, what climate change? You know, like, fishermen don't really know that. Uh, but when I asked them, why is it that you are getting less fish year after year? And they shared two things. One is pharmaceutical companies putting in a lot of waste uh, at, the, at the upstream uh, of, the, of the river. And the second reason is that downstream in the oceans, the corals are being trawled by big ships. And corals are home to life. These corals are home to fish. And I love fish. Uh, when I heard that, that the homes is, is being removed, essentially you are not only removing life as in the fish, but you're also removing the livelihoods of the fishermen. Uh, and when you affect livelihoods, uh, what we later on discovered is that some of the fishermen actually have to sell their own children, unfortunately, and some ended up in brothels. And with all that, I decided to join Cent Help Center for Ocean Solutions to create the world's first Palau shark sanctuary uh, to make sure that, you know, at least sharks have a sanctuary where they can call home. And thankfully, this was in 2010, and now it's 2016, life is coming back. My wish is someday that we have a sanctuary here in Singapore. It's difficult, but if there is a sanctuary in Singapore, maybe next time we can have more dolphins, can do dolphin watching, and that would be an awesome future for us. The other things that boggled me uh, when I was going through my technology route was this, uh, this frustration. We live in a highly 5C world, right? For those who are familiar with 5C, I, I remember sharing 5C with an American, and she was like, are you sure? Is that a joke? So 5C, for those who are not familiar, 5C stands for? Cash, credit card, condo, right? Car, career, some people say country club. And what I was frustrated was, you know what? We have a lot of cash moving around in the world. We have one of the best technologies. This is like the best century of a lot of technologies. We have a lot of leaders saying a lot of things and a lot of promises, but yet we continue to cut down trees, pollute the air, produce a lot of waste, and we cannot even feed a thousand or even a million people who are in hunger. And this is something that made me go bananas. La. So it's something that, that, that just, it's like an irony. We are living in these times. And later on, when I was in, in, in university, I decided, okay, hack my grades. Because uh, I didn't do too well la, for the first uh, semester, right? <laughs> so I decided, okay, maybe as, I mean, I'm an engineer, so I calculate, okay, maybe my trajectory would be, okay, I won't get my, my first class honor, so might as well I just do something else, right? So, you, so UNESCO sent a, a call for engineers around the world to work on certain problems. So what we did was, like a lot of people, right? Let's, want, let's do healthcare, let's do water, let's do energy. But when I spoke to my professor, my professor said, you know, why not you look at food? And that's when I started to work on food. So we, de we designed a solar food dryer for a, 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 a village in India, and it later on became a non-profit. So we start to look at food beyond just growing food. So now I learn about food. We also need to think about how we preserve food and how to make food into an economic opportunity for the poor in the villages. But nothing beats this. I've always been excited about technology until I really discovered the Kampong campus through Mr. Tay Lai Hock. So Mr. Tay Lai Hock, he's the founder of Ground Up Initiative. He started off as a corporate person and a very inspirational figure. Later on, he decided to travel around the world and why. So the next definition of life is the opposite of death. And what happened was during, during uh, the early, in the 1990s, there was a Silk Air MI185 crash, right? For those who, have, uh, who are familiar with that in tragedy. Uh, he knew someone on that plane and essentially she passed away. But that set him thinking, if I were to die tomorrow, what would I regret not doing? And he felt deep inside him is that he needed to see the world as it is. And that's what he did. He dropped everything. Uh, he's a regional director in a tech company. He decided to drop everything and really travel the world, work in villages, get his hands dirty, do farming, do permaculture. And later on, he got inspired that he felt that Singapore needed a village. 
Singapore, for those who are not familiar, we have almost removed all the villages. Yesterday, I went to my grandma's home, because future me ended very late for me yesterday. So I decided to just drop by my, my grandma's home, and I asked her, how was it like living in a village? And she shared a lot of stories. Uh, and I kind of, like when I, when I heard that, it resonated a lot with what like Hawk did. We started doing disaster relief, doing floods. This is in Malaysia. So one of the, one of the, the things that we discovered was during flood times, there's a lot of uh, chaos, a lot of things, but food is something that is something that, that still is important. So we distribute resources, right? Get the volunteers, came together, distribute food and appliances again. And I felt that Singapore needed, after going through a lot of rounds of flood, he felt that Singapore needed a space. A space where, as a community, we come together and do farming, get connected with the land, and participate in the healing of the land. So one thing which I... I used to be very cynical. I used to be someone who believed that it is not possible to bring back life to dead land. Every time I hear about desertification news, I'm like, okay, so we can't do anything about it. Why bother, right? Until I found GUI. This piece of land used to be empty, barren, clay land. Nothing grows on it. But what this community did from the ground up was to rally a group of people together and essentially bring back life. Bring back life. It's quite interesting. Huh? Tomorrow is Easter Sunday, right? So it's about, you know, like death and then now we bring back life, right? To revive back the land, right? And, uh, and how we do it, it's through continuous weekly engagement with the land. And we have something called Balik Kampung, right? Where Every Saturday, volunteers from all walks of life, uh, young, young at heart, engineers, architects, chefs, counsellors, artists, come together and help build this space called home, called Kampong Campus. Uh, and it's a, it's a very experimental ground. So currently, what we are building, we are building up something called the prototyping zone. right? So it's a bit dark, but this is like a carpentry area. I think the person earlier, uh, the speaker earlier shared about the importance of you know, getting our hands dirty and, and build something, build something. So these are people that come by to the space and really participate in building up the space. Because a lot of people thought Ground Up Initiative only do farming. So I want to share a bit more that you know, we don't only do farming, we do other things as well. But it's all about trying to create this diverse ecosystem to create a new narrative for Singapore, which we call the 5G narrative a future of Singapore that is more gracious, that's more giving, that's more green, that's more grounded and more grateful. It, these are very intangibles, but we know deep in our, in our hearts that these are important things. When we say being gracious, it means that, you know, we, let's be open-hearted as a community. For example, if we are an edible city and we have enough food to supply for our own selves, when our neighbours are facing problems, will we be gracious enough to share that food with others? Right? That is a challenge that we have not really reached that stage yet, but that could be a challenge in the future, a very real challenge. When you talk about green, what does it mean to be green? Does it only simply mean that you grow, some, grow, grow green stuff? Uh, how about, like, for example, when we have a lot of waste wood, how about using waste wood to create something new and bring back a second life to an object, to become like tables and chairs? When we talk about giving, right? What does it mean? Do, does, it, does it only mean that we only do CIP hours, right? And then collect your hours? Or does it mean that you really give your fullest potential, your fullest energy, your full of life to the passions that you want to do, the things that you want to achieve? When we talk about grounded, one thing which I learned about farming, farming is one of the best uh, ways to get people back to the ground and to make leaders realize that, you know what, ultimately, even, even if we can come up with the best visions in our offices, uh, until we go to the ground and really get our hands dirty, that's where the magic is, and that's where the magic always happens at the kampong. Uh, the farmers work very, very hard, and a lot of things that we learn is humility. Right? When you get your hands dirty and everyone toils on the ground, you start to be uh, more humble, you start to learn from one another. And last but not least is grateful or gratitude. Uh, and I think on that note, uh, as an edible city or even a city in a forest, how can we express gratitude to one another, to our forefathers, to those who have helped build this whole nation together? 
And on this note, I really would like to thank everyone over here, uh, my friends who are at Ground Up Initiative who are supporting over here, and I think last but not least to Kelvin and the organizers for letting us to share a bit about our story to all of you about what the future of Singapore could be. We are a small village, uh, but we believe that when more of us come together to the village and help build this Kampong campus, I think Singapore can really be that, maybe not little red dot, maybe a little green dot. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, I can't ask you for No worries. Awesome. So that was, that was great. That's a, a value-led system. And, and, you know, it's so inspiring to see him and, and um, Ta Mr. Tan grow kindness outside of Singapore as well.